right, good morning. What are we trying to do here at Rock Ridge Church? Anybody? What are we trying to do? What, what's our, what, what is our mandate from Jesus? Make disciples of all nations, anyone, everyone around here. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to do. And, um, and the reason on Sunday mornings we preach from the Bible and teach from the Bible is because we're, we don't make this up. This comes directly to us from the Lord. And so, therefore, we've got to stick to what he says, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Make disciples, be his witnesses. By the way, before we get going, uh, Edith's family wants to thank everyone for your calls, for your visits, for all the support uh, during this time. And uh, just to, to reaffirm that if you do want to go visit Edith, please call ahead. And uh, you're, you're very much welcome uh, to be there. I'm going to be going over there after church today, so... Uh, thanks for all your prayers. Thanks for all your prayers for Carol Barnes and, um, and everybody else who is struggling physically right now in our church. It is uh, a lot, and so thanks for your prayers. All right, Acts chapter 16. We're on a new chapter this morning. We're going to be doing verses 1 through 5. If you have Bibles, turn there. If not, it will be up here for you later on. In the world of sports, you often hear about teams in the midst of what they call a rebuilding year, right? That's code... And what that means is we're not going to win many games this year, right? If you follow a team that's in a rebuilding year, that means that, uh, you know, be patient. We're not, it's not going to, it's going to be a long year. Um, and uh, what they're trying to do usually is they're going to go with younger, less expensive players, and they'll need to have a couple years of experience for these players to get better individually. Also need a couple of years for them playing together to develop team chemistry, Therefore, since uh, we're putting an inferior team together on the field, uh, we're also going to raise ticket prices. So we thought you'd like that as well, right? That's what you hear a lot from teams. Jim Collins wrote a book. He's a uh, kind of a business guru. He wrote a book called Good to Great. It's fairly old now. It was published in 2001. And he, and he said, that, and what they did in this book is they researched 1,435 companies that were considered good. And they examined the performance of those companies over 40 years, and their goal was to find the 11 companies that became really great. So that's, that's the name of the book, Good to Great. One of the things they talk about is, uh, and they, he uses the metaphor of a bus, and he says, you're a bus driver. The bus, your company, is at a standstill, and it's your job to get it going. You have to decide where you're going, how you're going to get there, and who's going with you, right? Where you're going, who's going, you know, wh what you're, uh, where you're going, how you're going to get there, and who's going with you. Most people assume that great bus drivers or business owners immediately start the journey by announcing to people on the bus where they're going, right? You set vision for, for everybody. By setting a new direction, you articulate fresh corporate vision and values and all of that. And that's where you start. Their research showed that that's not where you start. Where you start first, companies that went from good to great didn't start with where they were going, but they started with who. Who's on the bus with you? In other words, these companies, they didn't start out by saying, here's where, you know, by getting a bunch of people saying, that's where we're going. They started by first selecting people and once they selected the people, then they said, here's where we're going. In other words, they, 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 they focused on people first before vision. Now, that's a little bit contrary to what you hear very often in business circles or any other circles, and that is, we're going to focus on vision and people will come along. No, they, you started with people. Now, Paul, uh, after Paul and Barnabas divided, and we looked at that last week, right? They, they, had, a, they had a breakup. And Barnabas went one way and Paul went another. They still remain uh, in ministry. Barnabas, if you remember, took Mark, and Paul chose a guy named Silas and, and, and went with him. Paul needed a new team. Last week, he picked the first member of his team, a guy named Silas. Now, this week, as he goes back to the area of Lyconia and Galatia, the areas we're going to look at, he'll pick yet another team member and one who becomes like a son to him, a guy named Timothy. Then, as we'll see in subsequent weeks, this team takes the gospel west, and that's important for you and I, because we're west of Israel, and that's the direction the gospel went primarily. Now, we often think of Paul 
as this rugged individual who, who single-handedly took the gospel on his shoulders and spread it throughout the world of the first century, right? We use Paul as an example for evangelism, all kinds of stuff, a- as if he was doing it by himself. However strong he was, Paul never acted alone. In fact, when you go to the New Testament, you never see, you never see people just acting alone. You always see teams. It's the example Jesus set, and it's the example that the church followed in the first century. A lot of times we think of evangelism as a single-person uh, enterprise, that we go out and do something by ourselves, right, because we're so bold. It's always a team. That's why life groups are so important here, because it's done best as a team. He always had a team with him, and he gave great responsibility to those who were on his team. Obviously, he did not choose yes men or women. These were people that would push back a little bit at Paul sometimes. We found that last week with Barnabas did. So we're in Acts 16. They're going to start a new thing. Here we go, verse, starting at verse 1. If you have your Bibles turned there, if not, it's up here. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Now that doesn't sound like the most riveting passage of Scripture, does it? Right? But it's what comes next, and that's where we are. Here's the point today. As Paul builds a new team, he combines strong principles with flexible strategies. All right, here we go. First point. Let me introduce Silas and Timothy to you. Who were they? Since it's important who you get on the bus, this is important for Paul. In verse 40, it says, But Paul chose Silas, in uh, in verse 40 in chapter 15, back a chapter, it says, But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been (coughs) commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So who was Silas, anyway? Class, you heard his name before in Acts? He was what? He was was one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. All right, we know that. And he came to Antioch with Paul after the decision at the Jerusalem council. So he was one who who was already a leader. And he was a leader in the Jerusalem church. He was Jewish, but he was a Roman citizen, which is going to be advantageous as Paul took the gospel west. Um, he, he was, um, uh, and that's going to be really important when they get to the city of Philippi. He was probably fluent in Greek, and he is included in two greetings in Paul's epistles, First and Second Thessalonians. So when you see those letters open up, you will see Paul saying, hey, it's Paul. And I'm with Silas and Timothy. All right, so that, that you see that in First Thessalonians. So that's who, that's who Silas was, a mature believer, already a leader. Second guy is Timothy, and here's the passage, uh, Acts 16, 1. Paul also came, came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, all right? So he sees something in Timothy and says, I I want this guy. Mark was not with him, and Mark was a younger believer, and and Timothy was young too. The last time, what happened to Paul last time he had been at Derby? Not much, really. He was actually kind of calm. A lot of people believe. What happened, however, at Lystra? Anyone remember? No? I'm not surprised. Back in chapter 14, if you want to read about it, but here's what place. This is the place where he and Barnabas had been mistaken for Zeus and Hermes, the Greek gods. All right? Then Paul got the pleasant experience of getting stoned, and I'm not talking about on drugs. I'm talking about the old-fashioned way of getting stoned with rocks thrown at you on your head. He had been, he'd been dragged out of the city, left for dead, but he wasn't dead. Not quite dead yet, for those of you who get it, all right? 
He went back. He went back there. He went back in the city, and then he left later on. So Timothy was from Derby, and uh, had probably seen the results of Paul's getting stoned the first time. And now Paul comes back to Derby, and he's ready to go back to Lystra. And he says to Timothy, I want you. Again, Timothy probably became a believer on Paul's first missionary journey during this trip after seeing Paul get beaten around. And Paul says, I want you to go with me. Now, if you're Timothy and you're about 16, 17, maybe 18 years old, what are you thinking? You'd you're be like Kevia from, from uh, Fiddler on the Roof, right? Says, God, I realize we're the chosen people. But sometimes couldn't you choose someone else, right? I, I'm not sure I want to go on this if, if it means that I'm going to get you know, beaten up. So Timothy was a very young man, perhaps in his late teens. His mother and grandmother were Jewish. We find that out from Paul's letter to him in 1 Timothy. And we also find it out here. His father had been a Gentile, probably was, was, had died by this time. The, the, the way the passage reads, he was probably not with them he was gone he was he was he had died timothy here becomes a he will become a missionary with paul and silas and he'll prove himself over and over again paul wrote two letters to him later on we that we know them by first and second timothy he became really the lead guy in the city of ephesus which paul has yet to go to but we'll get there this trip and, and so he becomes really important becomes a leader Timothy is included in the greeting of six of Paul's letters. So at the beginning of the letter, Paul says, hey, it's Paul and uh, Timothy. And, and these letters are uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So Timothy became a really important guy on Paul's team. Perhaps the most important guy on Paul's team. We, we hear about him more than we do even Silas, who by this time was a pretty mature believer. So Paul gets two new guys, one a seasoned veteran and one a rookie to get started. Application points. Paul didn't do things alone, neither should we, ever. There, there's a, a fellow pastor I know from Costa Mesa. They have a, a motto at their church, don't do ministry alone, and that's, that's really a good motto. Don't do it alone. We really can't. We're, we're, we're really not as good alone as we are together because part of, part of our ministry is how we treat each other. What did Jesus say? People will know you're my disciples if you what? Have love one for another. And by the way, they'll know that I've been sent if you're unified together. You can't do that by yourself. And so being together, being on a team is really important for this enterprise called the gospel. Jesus invented it that way. Do things together. Choose carefully your team, paying attention to your own strengths and weaknesses. Last week, we said, look, if you're a people person, you better get a task-oriented person on your team. And if you're a task-oriented person, you better get a people person on your team, or you ain't going to have a team. Because you'll offend everybody, and they'll get mad at you and leave. All right? You, you need to have both. You, we need to fill in the weaknesses that we all have with other people. So that's Okay, the second point is this. Paul shows flexibility and sensitivity in his evangelism strategy. And he took with him, the passage says, and circumcised him. Again, we get the, the wonderful topic of circumcision here. Because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, the question obviously here is, they had just fought this big battle up in Jerusalem about if Gentiles come to faith, do they have to, be, do they have to become Jewish? And of course, the sign for Jewish male is circumcision. Do you have to do that? The decision came down, no, you don't. And Paul was the biggest fighter to say, no, you don't. Why in the world would he go to the, to the, to the trouble here and make Timothy go to the trouble of getting circumcised? I mean, he was not a baby. He felt it. So why, why is he doing this after he'd, just, after he'd just gone through all of that? I know you were thinking that, and so let me answer it. The issue was not salvation here. Paul wasn't saying Timothy has to get circumcised in order to be saved. What he was saying, it, it was a strategic and a tactical th thing that Paul was doing. The passage tells us he got him circumcised because there are a lot of Jewish people who live nearby. And by the way, Timothy was considered Jewish because his mother was Jewish. Now, if you're going to take Timothy out to witness about Jesus, 
to Jews and Gentiles, he wouldn't get past the front door if the Jewish people knew that he was Jewish and wasn't circumcised. He just wouldn't listen to him. It was a strategic, tactical thing. Paul shows some flexibility here in tactics. Do you understand? There's a, there's a big difference between saying you don't have to do this to be saved and we're going we're gonna to do this so that we get a hearing with these people over here. It's not an issue of salvation, but it is an issue of being listened to. Paul, Paul really gives his philosophy of evangelism in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses, 22, or verses 19 through 23. Many of you know this passage, but I'm going to read it. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. Here's what Paul says. Even though I am a free man, and, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the, that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. All right, what's the common thread running through that passage? He adapts to what and for what? He's not just doing this for the heck of it. Why is he adapting so much? For, for the purpose of the gospel. Okay, another one. Here's, here's the way Paul frames it. If I can put it this way, Paul says, I'm not the boss. I am, I am living my life not simply to please my own tastes and desires. I'm living my life because there's this bigger purpose that I have in mind, and that purpose is this wonderful thing that Jesus did for us. It's called the gospel. I will serve that and, of course, the Jesus who invented it. And if I have to be uncomfortable, or if I have to put myself in awkward situations, or if I have to adapt, uh, if I have to adapt my, my behavior that is not a moral issue, but it's a cultural issue or something else, and be, let's be very clear on that, all right? Paul is not compromising any moral issue or any mandate of Scripture. What he was saying is that I'm going to try to find common ground with everybody I can. Why? Because the stakes are great. I don't want to do something that is so offensive to this culture over here and mean that they're not going to hear me when I start telling them that Jesus loves them. In other words, his life was in service to something bigger than him. That service was the gospel. Therefore, he was willing to be flexible with every culture, and he was going to need this flexibility because he was going to go to a lot of different cultures. Missionaries will tell you that. Look, when we send a missionary any place in this world, wherever it is, we, we do not expect the missionary to go there and start violating cultural norms just for the heck of it, do we? I mean, that's a pretty bad missionary if they're doing that. We expect the missionary to go learn about the culture, to adapt when, when necessary, uh, so that they'll be heard. Adapting is a way of loving someone. It's saying, look, it, okay, you don't drink wine in your house, I won't drink wine in your house. You do drink wine in your house, I'll have a glass with you. Maybe two, all right? So, it's, it's, so you get the idea. He's flexible. Just short of just short of too you know too much. So make sure you you don't. So Paul says I do everything. So that that was his philosophy. That was his the way he did ministry. All right. He was a servant of the gospel. He was not even a servant of his own freedom. Paul didn't go places and demand his rights. He gave up rights 
if necessary, for this bigger thing called the gospel. He knew, he knew what you and I need to know, and that is that the gospel thread is spread through ongoing relationship combined with a clear explanation of the gospel. We hear statistics from time to time about church growth and things like that and church membership. Um, there's one statistic that should really hit us in the face, and it goes back to the Institute of American for Church, uh, Institute for American Church Growth. They asked 10,000 people about their pilgrimage. In other words, what led them to come to church, to be part of a church body? The answers were, here, here's some of the reasons. Uh, people had a special need. In other words, they, you know, they, they were struggling with something in their life. Maybe addiction, maybe something else. They came to church looking for answers, looking for hope. And a lot of people do that, so 2%. Uh, people who walked in saw signs, 3%. The pastor, 6%. Now also, 6% or more leave because of the pastor, so that's where you go. Visitation, in other words, they came, somebody visited them, 1%. Sunday school, you got another to have something for the kids. 5%. Some kind of evangelistic push by the church. To, you know, they did something to get people in. 5%. Some program, like program for kids, program for youth, something like that. 3%. Now, I'm not knocking any of those percentages. All right? 1% is important. If it's one person, that's important. Somebody who came and really got involved, became a believer, became a, a, became a true disciple of Jesus, really, and, and really dug in in a church. We got a lot left, right, as far as percent. Guess what the percentage is? Somebody who came because somebody brought them and formed a relationship with them. 79%. 79. The gospel does not spread because people like me get trained in seminaries and, and, and put up a church building and start preaching on Sunday morning. That's not the way it, well, 6%. But 79%, 79% come because you are involved in somebody's life, because, because you are praying for someone, because a neighbor moved next door who's new and you reached out to that person, because there's somebody in your workplace that, you, that, that talked to you about a need in their life and you, and you had compassion on them, you began praying, you began talking to them. That's how the gospel spreads. Your life group reached out to another person, and you formed relationships. That's how the gospel spreads. It's, it's not a matter, it's not so much a matter of content when people understand it. it is a mat it's almost a matter of a virus that gets caught. A good virus in this case. And, 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 and that's the way it spreads kind of exponentially. That's what happened in the first century. Paul did what he did in starting these churches, but these churches grew because the people in the community reached out. Folks, that's how it works. That's how it will work with this church or any church for that matter. It works through relationships, and Paul understood that. Therefore, he was sensitive in his relationships with people. All right. Next point is this. Paul delivers and teaches a consistent gospel. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened uh, in faith, and they increased in numbers daily. What were the decisions at the Jerusalem Council, all of you guys, class? What happened in chapter 15 of Acts? Huh? Okay, basically, they didn't even say that in, in the letter that the Jerusalem elders and apostles wrote. They just said, we're not going to trouble you. <laughs> Believe me, if you're an adult male, circumcision is being troubled. <laughs> so we're not going to trouble you. All right, in other words, to be a Christian, and in this culture, it was a big deal because Christians started with Jews. But to be a believer now, to be a follower of Christ, you did not have to be a good, observant Jewish person. In other words, a proselyte to do that. It would have been understood in that culture. You don't have to do all the things that Jewish people, you see them doing. 
all the religious stuff you see them doing. Respect the law of God, but you don't, you don't do all this cultural stuff. Besides that, they said, and by the way, this, this council showed some sensitivity as well. They told both Jew, they, they told the churches, look, abstain from things from meat that's offered to idols, abstain from things that are strangled, and abstain from sexual immorality. And when we looked at that, we also saw that sexual immorality was not just sex outside of marriage, it was don't marry your sister or, or your first cousin. You know, so it, was, it, was, it went back to Deuteronomy, and that was some of the stuff. And the reason given is because, they're, because Moses is taught. And again, they were making allowances. They were ma making some strategic things to reach out to the Jewish people there. But also a big thing was this. The churches were made up of what two ethnic groups? I mean, there were more, but two main ones. Jew and Gentile, they had to live together, okay? Now, if you're sitting down to dinner with your Jewish friend, what they were basically saying is don't serve pork. All right, pork is not the issue, but sensitivity is. So be sensitive to what's going on so that you as a church can coexist in harmony here. Don't just, don't go tell your Jewish friends who are, who are also Christian. You know, this pork thing is really ridiculous. We're, we're, dig in, here's some bacon. All right, they were saying, look, during the, when you're together like this, be sensitive to that so that you guys can live in harmony. In all cases, Paul makes it clear that what is important and what is essential and what is optional. The gospel, the content of it is, is, is essential, but cultural practices are optional. He makes it clear in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, when he says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, salvation first, works follow. Salvation first. The works follow. The works are not there to get salvation. The works result from salvation. Paul makes it clear. He never wavered from his theology and salva that salvation comes to us as a gift of God through our faith in the work of Jesus, period. There's no addendums to that. Period. So with his two new companions by his side and more to follow, Paul starts on what is really his most interesting of his four missionary journeys that he'll take during his career. And it's also the most productive, as we're going to see in, in, in coming weeks. I had a map, and I didn't show it to you. Did I? Did you see it up there? Did you understand it? There it is. All right. I meant to do this in the first one. So, Paul leaves Antioch with Silas, may have been down, down here in Jerusalem, and he, he travels up here. His hometown, by the way, was right about here, Tarsus. He may have gone there. And then he went to where he'd gone before, Derby and Iconium. That's where he was stoned. Now, in coming weeks, he's going to go through this region, and he's going to end up going north. And this, by the way, this is present-day Turkey. And he's going to end up in what is present-day Macedonia and Greece. The gospel goes west. And Charles is going to speak to you next week of how some of that happened. So, question as we leave here today, as we, as we wrap it up. What do you need to retool in your life today? What new start do you need to make? Maybe you need to make a new commitment to just simply being a disciple of Jesus. You, you need to retool there. You need to make a fresh commitment. Dallas Willard says that anything we do in our life that's new needs needs to have three elements, and he uses the acronym VIM, V-I-M. You need to have a vision of what it looks like. You need to have the intent to do it, and then you have to have the means to do it. So they think, use that acronym, VIM. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. What does that look like? Do I really intend to do it? And do I have the means to do it? Um, by the way, may I suggest one means. It's a means. It's not the only means. 
But this is a great way to get together with two or three individuals and just go through this thing called Discipleship Essentials. It's not magic, but they're just some basic things about what it means to follow Jesus. And the point is you're doing it together. You're not trying to do it alone. We are not meant to be loners on this journey. We're just not. We can't do it. Every, every survey I've ever done on spiritual growth, guess what is the, the, the most common answer when I, when I ask the question, what has kept you on a path to grow spiritually? Guess what the, big, the most common answer? Nine out of ten, easily, or more. I'm meeting with someone else. Someone else is encouraging me. I'm not doing it alone. We weren't meant to. When we try, I think we just said that we're not having a correct vision. So, by the way, we have some goals with this, too. We'd like to see, by the end of the year, um, by the end of th- we'd like to see at least 14 of these. We call them micro-discipleship groups. There's a whole bunch of books out there, so I know you have them. Now what we need to know is if you've started a group. And if you have, jot that on your Connect card so that we, we're not trying to control anything. We just want to know. We're setting it as a goal because the belief is if people are doing this, it's going to start making a qualitative difference in our church. If there's, if there's more and more people doing this, you don't have to ask my permission or anybody else's permission. Just get a book and get three people and get started. How easy. Except when you start making your schedules. Then, that, then it gets hard. So get started on that with someone. We also have a goal by the end of this year to have nine life groups. Right now we have six. Three, three more. Now, that's a little more involved. We need leaders. We need houses or places. All right? That's another way that you, that you can, if you envision this, that you can get, you can get going. Here's, here's the next step. All right? As a church and as individuals, we need to find common ground with our neighbors and friends in order to create a space for the gospel to be received by them. If you are not now serving someone for the sake of sharing the gospel with them, then get started this week. And I would also add to that, get started with somebody else. Don't try to do this alone. All right? Cool. You hot? Yes, Pastor Mike, it's very hot in here. (laughs) Stop talking. All right, we're going to stop talking. The band's going to come up, and we're going to close it up today. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for each one here. Thank you that you call us to be sensitive in our culture, and yet you give us this thing called the gospel, which is unchangeable from start to finish. Thank you for loving us. Jesus, thank you for coming because we had a problem called sin, and it was only through your sacrifice that we could achieve forgiveness of sin and receive the eternal life that only you have. So we thank you for this amazing thing called the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that you not only died for us, but you rose to put your exclamation point on the truth of everything that you proclaim. It's, it's remarkable in every way. Help us to treat it as such. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.